the Meru, so um, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Sometimes I over project, so if I get too loud and you start leaning backwards, I will um, respond accordingly. Uh, thank you, Behrouz, for inviting me, to all of you for being here today. Um, it's both timely to talk about this, uh, and unfortunately, it's always timely to talk about this issue because things haven't changed for a very long time, no matter what's happening inside Iran. Um, so anyway, uh, a month ago, uh, the United States and Israel conducted the largest ever coordinated war game together. How many of you heard about this? Okay, yeah. Uh, the simulated military exercise, codenamed Juniper Oaks 23.2, and yes, that means there were 22.8 
before it, uh, lasted for four days, involved over 6,000 Americans and over 1,000 Israelis, 140 airships and sea vessels, and close to 180,000 tons of live ammunition. Yeah, over four days. We can only speculate on the price tag of this, but that's neither here nor there about how much money probably went into this. Uh, but according to the Wall Street Journal, which reported on the war game, the war game was meant to, quote, signal, uh, was a signal of the two countries' cooperation in countering the threat Tehran and its proxy militias posed to regional stability, end quote. News of the war game came just days before what is in all likelihood an Israeli drone attack near Esfahan. All right. So now this isn't the first massive war game that the US has conducted in order to simulate and or prepare for military confrontation with Iran. As I've written in the piece in American Anthropologist that inspired my talk today, in 2002, the Pentagon ran a $250 million war game called the Millennium Challenge 2002, MCO2 for short, which simulated a military conflict between the armed forces of the US, AKA the blue team, and a Gulf country closely modeled after Iran called the Red Team. MCO2 took two years to plan, so this is before 9-11, if you can imagine, and included over 13,000 servicemen, 17 different simulated locations, and nine live locations. Now, it's too soon to know whether Juniper Oaks you know, ended one way or another because that's all classified information. But we've had now over two decades since MCO2 uh, to know that that massive war game ended poorly for the United States, okay, the simulated conflict with the red team. In fact, what makes the simulation infamous in the security circles that I study is that midway through the simulation, the blue team stopped the exercise completely. Uh, and they argued that the red team was acting outside the parameters of what they expected of their enemy on both tactical and strategic grounds, okay? This was so egregious that the Marine Lieutenant General who was in charge of the red team filed a formal complaint to say that had they not stopped the simulation, the red team would have won. So what was the US security community's response to this expensive and rather disastrous war game? Let's run more of them, right? Um, so in 2004, they outsourced it this time to another group, The Atlantic, which is the publication, The Atlantic, uh, co-hosted a table war game with the uh, National War College. And if you guys don't know what table war games are, it's basically like a grown-up militarized version of like Dungeons and Dragons, where people like take on different roles, like, Behrouz will be Rumsfeld today, and Navid will be <laughs> Colin Powell, and you pretend that a conflict is taking place and that you are in the situation room, and you play it out in various scenarios. So how do you think this one went? Not so good, <laughs> again. So the journalist who was allowed to attend the entire thing concluded, this is how the war game turned out, with a finding that the next American president must, through bluff and patience, change the actions of a government whose motives he does not understand well, and over which his influence is limited. And of course, there's gendered language there where there's a presumption of the president being a man. But uh, that aside, basically, we did this whole scenario, and we decided that we don't know anything about Iran. All right? I'm not going to go through every single war game that's ever happened between then and there. but. Another one was run in 2012, codenamed Internal Lock, that actually simulated a war with Israel. So, okay, this time Israel is going to attack Iran. How is that going to go? Again, not so good. Brookings got in on the Brookings, the famous think tank, got in on the table war game. This time they invited a group of Iranian Americans to play the role of Iran at this table war game. Uh, they've never disclosed who was in that room, but uh, so this time Iran was represented. Um, again, through proxy. Um, and once again, lo and behold, it didn't end well for the United States. Uh, Kenneth Pollack, who some of you may know, was a former CIA analyst who then became a think tank expert at Brookings for many years. Now he's at the more conservative um, AEI. 
He wrote, the American teams, this is a quote from him, the American teams were surprised by the retaliation that their strikes triggered from the Iran teams, assumed that Iranian rhetoric would not translate into action, and quote, saw the Iranian reactions as excessive when the Iran teams chose to back up their words with corresponding actions. So, on and on, you can really like continue to trace just the war games on Iran, and it's actually not the focus of my talk today, but it just this is my entryway into the analysis that I'm gonna provide. So what's most interesting for me and perplexing about these war games is not only that they consistently seem to show the same thing, but that they run, uh, that they consistently show the same thing and that they continue to run more of them, but that the organizers repeatedly remark on the fact afterwards that they're surprised by Iran's response, right? There's this like continual posture of surprise, like how would, why would Iran actually do what it said it was gonna do, right? Why would it actually use tactics that we hadn't even thought of, right? There's this posture of surprise that makes up so much of the post-simulation analysis. Now, these war games are but a piece of a much larger knowledge apparatus that has been built over the past two decades, dedicated to understanding Iran as a geopolitical threat to the US and its allies. Since the US invaded Iraq in 2003, and we're sadly coming up to the 20 year anniversary soon, the US has identified Iran as its primary regional adversary. And you can easily track this in national security strategies. This isn't me saying it. Every single president from Bush to Biden has identified Iran as its primary regional adversary, uh, state regional adversary, right? So who makes up this knowledge apparatus? Uh, U.S. government analysts, obviously across the military, intelligence, diplomatic core. And there's, you know, I'm not going to bore you in terms of all the different places that they are placed within the government. Then there's Middle East uh, experts at think tanks, and these are my primary interlocutors into this world. Uh, other governments, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about the Emiratis, but a lot of other governments play a role in this space. Private consulting firms, so Booz Allen, Hamilton. Uh, basically all of Tyson's Corner, if you've ever been to DC, it's filled with these consulting firms that run data analytics, they analyze social media, they do cyber security intelligence. And then you have journalists, activists, academics, and corporations. Um, Amazon is now really big in the cybersecurity world, so another reason not to buy from them. Uh, they are very active in the intelligence fee and they share with the US government. So what do they conclude? What is this massive, multi-million dollar knowledge apparatus concluding about Iran? A bunch of paradoxes, right? Um, firstly, the US is losing the regional fight against Iran. This is consistently what you find when you track sort of the open source, and I don't work in any classified, I want to make that very clear, I don't work in any classified, I only work in open source. But in all the open sources, this is the information they give. The US is losing the regional fight against Iran, but the US can also stop Iran, using the exact same strategies they've been using for the past 20 years. So here's one paradox. Another is that the Islamic Republic of Iran is an exceptionally bad regional actor but then it ignores similar abuses when it's done with its allies. Right, we, everyone in this room understands that. Third, this one is very interesting and it has a lot of ramifications for when people talk about US policy moving forward, is that a lack of US presence inside Iran, a lack of a diplomatic presence in Iran is putting the US at a strategic disadvantage against Iran. Right, because they don't have quote unquote eyes and ears on the ground, and yet they consistently pursue policies that further isolate Iran diplomatically. Right? And then the fourth is that the Islamic Republic is incredibly powerful. You almost hear awe in the voices of these security analysts in terms of how powerful the Iranian security apparatus is, and yet it's also on the verge of internal collapse. Right? So these tensions come out in the analysis. And all of this sort of builds towards this bigger paradox that really is at the center of my own analysis. 
which is that if the US has dedicated all these resources and experts to studying its primary regional adversary, why can't the US security community predict, anticipate, or even counter Iran's geopolitical strategies, risk calculations, or threats, either in simulation or in real life? Right? That seems like a legit question. Why run war game after war game if you're just going to not listen to the results of it, in other words? Right? So I attribute these contradictions and tensions to uh, a, a posture of, government, uh, of, um, of governance called the geopolitics of illegibility. All right? Before I unravel what I mean by the geopolitics of illegibility. Let me take a step back and reintroduce myself because I think positionality is very important in all of this. So who am I? I, uh, as Behru mentioned, I'm trained as a political anthropologist. I'm interested in how ideas and expertise shape and sustain US foreign policy decisions in the Middle East, or more precisely, the politics of knowledge production fueling US empire. What shapes their decisions? What are their biases, assumptions? What schools did they go to? What did they major in? Who were their professors? Uh, what sources of knowledge do they use? How are they trained? What are their frameworks? Have they done field work in the country they claim expertise on? Can they speak the language of the country they do analysis on? Right? And of course, Iran emerged as my primary case study as I was doing my field work. Uh, and the way I went about doing this research was by following a tradition within anthropology to use the people-centered tools of ethnography to study the powerful as situated epistemic, political, and social actors. Whenever I present this in front of students who, who want to enter this world, um, I tell them, I spent two years in Washington going native, right, eating their foods, attending their events, dressing like them, um, you know, learning the speak, the DC speak, because it, they definitely have their own registers. Um, and I also followed a lot of my interlocutors into social spaces, because as an anthropologist, unlike political scientists, and no disrespect to the political scientists in the room, that was somewhere where I thought a lot of the politics in Washington happens in informal spaces, right? So it, you need to understand people when they're quote unquote, off the books, right? And they're uh, just getting together with people and exchanging information. And there's a lot of gray zones there where if people assume you're an insider, they share things with you that maybe they're not supposed to, right? Um, and uh, I also conducted over 180 semi-structured interviews from very high level US government officials all the way down to interns. And I, as I've said many times to other people, interns are my absolute favorite people to work with as interlocutors because they don't know what to tell me that they're not supposed to tell me. <laughs> um, so they will tell me their boss doesn't speak Persian even though they tell people they do. Or you know those kinds of little nuggets that are um, interesting. And I always bought coffee for them. So it was a very reciprocal relationship. <laughs> I've also done uh, previous ethnographic fieldwork in Iran, um, and I was doing it in this very heightened, this period of heightened sanctions on Iran, like really up until the JCPOA. And so a lot of times when my interlocutors in Washington would say something, I'd be comparing it directly to what I was seeing on the ground inside of Iran. So this was, I was able to actually see this geopolitics of illegibility firsthand. So what is the geopolitics of illegibility? Um, I define it as the sum of the intellectual, affective, political, and security work needed to ultimately represent Iran as an unknowable enemy. So from different vantage points, anthropologists and other critical scholars have studied the ways that states deploy techniques of legibility, right? Like think James Scott seeing like a state techniques of governmentality. Like states want to be able to make their populations legible in order to control them. So why would you want illegibility, right? Why would the US not want to know Iran if it has, again, identified it as its primary regional adversary? So my argument is that there are several interlocking structural factors that explain why um, 
This geopolitics of illegibility persists even when members of the security community may individually or even collectively recognize its absurdity and or futility. So the first one has to do with the way that the US empire operates as a transnational site of contested um, governance. So while traditional theories of US empire often treat it as a bound, coherent state apparatus beholden to the interests of the sovereign state, my research reveals that even uh, that in, within DC, as sort of the proverbial heart of, of empire, in practice is anything but coherent and bound. All kinds of actors, stakeholders, governments, and others are competing to shape the security imaginary um, and policies of the US. So other regional governments play a really big role in shaping how Washington views Iran. Among them, the Emiratis. So this is a very high level former government official who's now at a think tank. Um, and I don't use real names. Um, so Marty is not a person if you try to look him up. Um, in, he wrote, in a country like Iran where we don't have an embassy, I rely on close allies like the Emiratis to tell us what's happening. So think of this as like the biggest game of telephone Right, So the Emiratis interpret something through their embassy, and then that gets told to somebody at a desk officer in State Department, who then brings it up the chain all the way to the Secretary of State or to the Defense. Right? So this is, a, this is the kind of um, information gathering that's happening. And then there's this more insidious um, sort of political economy of expertise that con where power is contested in Washington. Right? Um, my interlocutors proudly say they are part of something called the marketplace of ideas. Um, and it is very much a market. It's a multi-million dollar industry where big bucks are being put into think tanks, into these private uh, research firms to analyze and understand Iran. Um, oil companies, ExxonMobil is one of the biggest funders of CSIS, for instance, and that never gets reported as a conflict of interest on any of their reports when it has to do with the region, right? Um, and so uh, when you have uh, a country like Iran that, uh, and, and the sort of marketplace that needs to, to keep fueling itself, you can understand that uh, they, these think tanks will promise to their donors that they can know Iran, that they can understand it, in geopolitical terms, um, and yet never actually deliver because then they will make themselves irrelevant in some sense, right? So it's always, I, I write it about it as in, um, it's a, they provide a knowable future that's always situated just beyond their grasp, right? Like if I just do a little bit more research, if you fund me for another report, this time I'll really get it. This time I'll really, really get my analysis right, okay? The second factor is just broadly uh, a shift in the way that governance happens in, in terms of governmentality, uh, where things are now outsourced to entities beyond the, the traditional structures of the state, and where much of the work of governing and analysis and creating policies is actually done by semi or non-state entities in ways that allow for this unaccountability to continue. So within the realms of national security and foreign policy that I study, this arrangement allows those in power to escape accountability for their own decisions. Oh, well, you know, this report told us that if we do this, this will be the result. That's not on us, this was the consensus within Washington at the time. And you see a lot of that, where they diffuse responsibility by saying, you know, well, this was what the experts were telling us. And so we followed what the experts say. Mind you, the experts don't have any cohesion whatsoever, but they can say, well, the experts told us to do this, right? And so every president since Bush has been accused of failing US foreign policy, and yet there's no consequences to that. And the reality is that according to their own stated security interests, they have failed. Iran has not retreated or shifted its geopolitical calculations to support US interests. Meanwhile, for the experts I study, they can produce and reproduce knowledge and never take responsibility for the policies they ultimately help enact. If Iran is forever unknowable and unpredictable, unpredict then they cannot be blamed for advocating for policies that ultimately do not turn out as they predicted 
or that may cause blowback or additional harm, not just to Iranians, but to Americans and to others in the region, including Iraqis, Yemeni, uh, Lebanese, Palestinians, etc. All right, the third <laughs> structural factor is this growing politicization, I cannot say the word, um, even though I've grown up in the US, uh, politicization of regional expertise <laughs> since 9-11. To be clear, I'm not talking about objectivity here because that's an illusion, we all know that. Um, but what I'm talking about is that the US security apparatus is consistently underinvested in, um, and uh, it, uh, sorry, it has uh, consistently underinvested in, actively fears and is skeptical of regional area expertise while over investing in fields like security studies that take a superficial view of societies history, politics. In fact, they're quite actively averse to things like social <laughs> analysis, right? And Martin Kramer and others blame this on fields like Middle East studies. They say it's your fault because you guys became too critical of US empire. And so maybe it's an amicable <laughs> divorce from both sides where regional studies doesn't want to serve empire and empire has basically completely eschewed um, regional studies altogether. Um, but then what happens is that this is the prevailing view in Washington. And this was the vice president of a very, very prominent think tank. And no, his name is not Abdul, but I liked making him have an Arab name. So knowledge is cheap. Facts are easy to find these days. I need someone who can analyze information and analyze it relatively quickly. I need people who write well, who speak well, and who have strong social media skills. So it's not about knowing the country that you're analyzing. It's not about spending time there. Anything that any of us, if I were to ask a group of undergraduates, how do you define an expert? None of these things would be on there. It would be about spending time, doing field work, learning the language, learning the history, learning the politics. None of that matters. And this is the person that hires experts for think tanks. This is the, the vice president's job. And when it comes to Iran, this reaches very absurd levels. Okay, where there's a systemic lack of substantive linguistic, cultural, social, historical expertise on Iran. Most have never been to Iran. They regularly um, use select members of the Iranian diaspora as proxies for all of the Iranian people and as primary sources of country knowledge. And this is something we can definitely discuss in Q&A if you'd like. And they have little to no direct contact with the Iranian government. So uh, oftentimes, as an analogy, even at the height of the Cold War, the United States had an embassy in Moscow, and they were constantly talking to the Soviet Union. The opposite is true when it comes to Iran. Right. So the, <laughs> oh, I wrote this as a side note, but the top Iran expert called in to testify before Congress between 2014 and 2015, before the JCPOA, he shall remain unnamed, um, has never been to Iran. This is the top expert. I believe he was called in 15 times to testify before Congress. Has never been to Iran, does not speak Persian, has an MBA, has never formal, formally studied the region's history or politics, and he's not a technical expert on nuclear issues. But yet he was the top expert, Iran expert, called in to testify before Congress. Right. Oops, I went too far. So the fourth factor, and this is the last one, I promise, um, has to do with the illogics of empire and what is unthinkable to an empire. Right? And this is where I get a bit more theoretical. Um, even as a contested entity, there is a systemic ideological failure as an imperial power to be able to see or even understand a country that resists its own hegemony. Right? And there have been attempts to do this. There are people within Washington that see the absurdity of this. Um, and want to address it. So Micah Zenko wrote an entire book called The Red Team, based on MCO2, saying how to succeed by thinking like the enemy. He wrote this in 2015. Nobody in Washington reads it, OK? <laughs> um, or I interviewed a former, former low-level intelligence officer who told me it was his job to study Qasem Soleimani. That was his profile. 
He had, he had to, every day had to wake up, go to work, and think like Qasem Soleimani, okay? Also a guy who doesn't speak Persian, has maybe been to two countries in the Middle East, but we'll put that aside. He was working through translation. Um, and he said, quote, my job was to get inside his head and to see the world through his eyes. And guess what? He actually did. He said, if I was Iranian, I would support Soleimani. Because if you're living and breathing this guy, you start to see the world through his end. And he told me that every time he wrote a memo, it was thrown in the trash. Right? No one wanted to hear what he had to say. And so what you end up with is this absurdity where Iran is actually treated as a state foreign to its own historical and geographic context, um, located outside of its own <laughs> um, region. Right? While the US is paradoxically treated like the benevolent uh, uncle who's come to you know, fix up the mess of the people in the region. As one think tank expert told me, quote, I just can't wrap my head around what Iran's playing at in Iraq. I mean, what's their real end game there? When I pointed out to him that unlike the United States, Iran shares nearly a thousand mile border with Iraq, fought a bloody eight year war, uh, with the country fueled by the United States, has had thousands of years of cultural, economic, religious, and political exchange with its neighbor, and currently has to contend with hostile US military bases across Iraq, he quickly dismissed my points. He said, yes, 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 we all know that. But why is Iran really in Iraq? <laughs> so you, you attend all these events, and I had to learn how to control my facial expressions. Uh, pretty early on, but you attend these talks where they t say, should Iran be included in a future Gulf security arrangement? And you want to raise your hand and say, Iran is already part of the Persian Gulf. <laughs> it already has relations with every single country in the Gulf. It has its own geopolitical um, negotiations with every single member of the Gulf. What do you mean, should they be included in a future Gulf arrangement? Yeah. And so we cannot escape the underlying racism and Orientalism uh, feeding into these types of questions. And what makes it almost comical is even with the war games, where they have a Marine Lieutenant General cosplaying an Iranian general, even then they silence them, right? Because once again, the very idea of resisting the US in ways that they cannot conceive of or anticipate is in itself unthinkable. And I'm going to end on a kind of a depressing note here, but unfortunately, those who pay the highest cost of this geopolitics of illegibility are the ordinary Iranian people, right? Who's suffering at the hands of both their own government and those of the US remain, in the words of Judith Butler, ungrievable, right? Because they just become pawns in a game that's a simulated game that doesn't really matter fundamentally to anybody in Washington. Right? We'd like to think that those in the US security apparatus are sophisticated, that they understand the distinctions between the Iranian people and their government. And on a political and human level, they do. They make statements in support of the Iranian people. They condemn human rights abuses. But when it comes to the logics of their own defense and security, the people and the government become one and the same. I went way too long, sorry. No, 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 it was just we wanted you to go longer, but we have time. We'll bring you back. OK, yeah. thanks. So uh, we have, uh, yeah, okay. we have a good time. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, that's great. Great question. Um, one of the limitations of being an anthropologist is I was following my uh, interlocutors where they were. But I've been told anecdotally that a lot of what I say about Iran also applies to Russia and China. Um, and it's not uniquely Iran. The problem with Iran is the complete lack of contact that makes it unique even among those um, case studies. And I was uh, comparing a bit of US policy towards Egypt just to have a, sort of a frame of reference. And there's also, they have no problem going to Egypt. They have eyes and ears on the ground. And still, they have a lot of problems understanding Egyptians. But there is this uniquely, um, and I don't want to use ableist la uh, language here, but like there's a gaping blind spot when it comes to Iran. Um, and it, it, it's very noticeable when you're just looking at it systematically across the board. That, yes, some of it is, is hubris of, of US exceptionalism. Some of it's about just like laziness when it comes to expertise and wanting to know other societies. But some of it is also uniquely about Iran. So yeah, that helps. Um, thank you so much. Um, I was curious to ask more about um, your thoughts on, I guess, your point about um, in one of the slides, how has the has diaspora COVID um, shaped your viewpoint? Your and what are um, the ones that are kind of imposed or in general problem, problematized um, that they are, you know, a lot of the uh, voices that you hear in the rhetoric are things that you have either imposed through uh, Iran or have um, tried to do so at some point in the lives of the Iranians, um, and whether or not it's kind of like being held up with um, maybe fake bias or you know, what, what sort of influence have your views been able to gain? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, again, understanding that uh, it's a contested landscape, different diasporic voices have influence in different spaces within Washington. So on the Hill, it's the MEK. They dominate. And that's officially above board. You can look it up, and not, it's not conspiracy theories. They dominate the discourse on the Hill. They're really good. They're very well organized. They know all the offices. They they're on the Rolodex of every. And they change their names in ways that can be confusing. So I've had friends who will call me and be like, have you heard of this group? And we do a little bit of digging, and we figure out it's MEK. They just change their name. Who do it, who do it, who do it, who oh, oh, sorry. The uh, which is, um, what is the correct way to? Um, they are a leftist Marxist group that is very controversial in Iranian circles because they have advocated for military interventions against Iran in the past, and they're very unpopular domestically within and Iran. Used to be on the list. And they used to be on the terrorist list. And thanks to a lot of uh, lobbying, they were removed from the State Department's terrorist list. Um, so yes, they are very powerful. They pay for people like Pompeo, for um, lots of Democrats have gone to their uh, conferences and spoken and take their retainer fees. Um, even. Uh, that's right. That's right. Um, so yes. And who is the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee? So Menendez is quite, quite powerful uh, within Washington. Um, and he will take money from them as well. So when you're talking about the Hill, they dominate. And there's a little bit of cynicism within that, where it's just like a lot of people are like, we take their money, but we don't really do much. <laughs> uh, and then there's other people who are like, no, they fundamentally have shifted the narrative on the Hill. Um, so it depends on who you're asking. Um, when you're talking about State Department, it depends on which party you're in. Uh, they will listen to parts of the diaspora. If, if you're talking about the far right wing or right wing, they will listen to members of the diaspora who want to see a complete overthrow of Iran and potentially with US direct US um, intervention or indirect US intervention. And then we have liberal uh, groups who will talk to then Iranians who align with their ideological perspective. So really, it kind of depends on who you're talking to. Um, and the danger in all of this is uh, they're conflicting interests, right? So um, and I'm not saying this in terms of like dual loyalties, but uh, if your primary goal is to see some result inside of Iran. And you don't actually care what the consequences are for the US, 
or for other people in the region, um, your analysis is suspect, right? Um, and so there's this weird tension, too, in Washington where they will take Iranians that agree with their perspectives, but never fully accept them as analysts of the region either, right? So there's this weird uh, kind of like jujitsu <laughs> with the Iranian diaspora communities where they'll be like, are you going to basically uh, rubber stamp the policy that I already wanted to put into place? Because otherwise, I don't want to hear a lot of criticism from you as an analyst in your own right about what's happening inside of Iran, right? So Iranians that tend to be critical of US foreign policy don't get reinvited back. And so that's another, there's like a self-selection <laughs> process there where it's like the Iranians that say what they want to hear get invited again and again and again and get invited to speak on CNN. Um, and then that becomes its own loop where then they become very prominent um, voices. Yeah. How do they interpret it? How should they interpret it? How should they interpret it? Ooh, that's scary for me as an anthropologist. <laughs> um, OK. So um, I, I think I'll work, work around your question in a way by saying that there's a lot of people who claim. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so. Um, <laughs> There's an entire subcategory of Iran experts whose expertise is on Iran's support of Hezbollah, of Hamas, um, of the Houthis in Yemen. They, that's Tony Badran, for example, is someone who in Lebanon uh, who his sub expertise within the Iran space is that he's an expert on Iran's support of quote unquote proxies in the region. Um, and I'm not sure what their actual qualifications are for, <laughs> for making those claims. Besides, in Tony's case, he's Lebanese, and he grew up in Lebanon and has a particular perspective on Iran's role in that country. Um, but how they should study it, I mean, they should go and spend time and see how people actually, uh, like this is something that I can, see, I can speak very clearly to on the Houthis in Yemen. Overnight in Yemen, there were suddenly 50 Houthi experts in Washington, DC. Before that, you couldn't find a person in Washington who knew who the Houthis were, right? So overnight, they pick up on the fact that, OK, this is a hot issue. And they read news articles. And maybe they go to the Congressional Research Service and get some analysis there. Or they go and uh, read open source, in translation, open source. <laughs> information about the Houthis, and then make assessments, and then go on CNN and are proclaimed experts on the Iran's role in supporting the Houthis. Yeah. So sh how they should do it is probably like actually go and spend time in those groups and <laughs> see what Iran's role is in supporting them in practice.
That's a great question. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, honestly, I don't think the United States is going to directly attack Iran. I think they have essentially figured out that it's not going to end well for them. <laughs> but they need to keep the threat on the table, as they will call it, as a strategy for whatever else they want to do, whether diplomatically. Now, will they green light the Israelis to attack? That's on the table, I do think. Um, but do I think the United States will directly attack? I don't think so. I think there's no stomach for it in Washington. Um, but they want to keep the threat very real. And that's part of why they do these war games. Um, and by the way, Iran does war games in reverse. Um, if I have time, I would love to study those, because those must be very fascinating. I would love to see how they portray the Americans in those. Um, but yeah, so do I think the US is going to directly militarily intervene? I don't think so. But they may do it through proxies. Um, one of my fears is that they will um, sort of tap into internal cleavages within Iran, uh, which they've done in other places as well. Um, because they do understand that if they go in the way they did in Afghanistan, the way they did in Iraq, it will only cause them to be in quagmire for 20, probably more years. So yeah, I don't think full-scale military intervention is on the table at all, luckily. Yeah, such an anthropological question. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so what you're revealing is um, the inherent bias that I had going into my own research, which was, uh, if the US just knew more about Iran, would they change their policy, right? Um, if they just had better information, would it fundamentally change US foreign policy? I'm not sure, right? That's, uh, that's my own bias. In terms of like, just knowledge will create something better. Um, and again, Egypt as the counterpoint is like they have the knowledge and they're doing pretty poorly um, in terms of what they're doing inside of Egypt. Um, but I think the the point of being there on the ground is just the absurdity of it more than anything. Which is that how can you understand very complex political movements, security concerns? without having ever walked the streets of the place that you are making definitive statements on. And again, I'm not overly fetishizing being there. Um, as John Jackson often says, don't overly fetishize being there. You're going you're gonna to get to many of these things through other sources. But then you should know the language, right? Like, if you're not going to be there, then at least learn the language so that you can read it through other people. So you can read Iran <laughs> through the people that are on the ground. So the problem with the protests on the ground is, yeah, people are doing things, and then it gets on social media. But no one in Washington is reading it in the primary language. They're reading it through somebody who translated it for them. And guess what? That person has an agenda. Um, so it's about like layers of mediation, too, that are happening here. So the illegibility happens in these like spaces of mediation. Um, it's not about like 
you have to be this or that in order to make Iran legible. It's about um, not even making the attempt to try to understand Iran in its own terms. Even to say it's incredibly complicated, and anyone who tells you that they're an Iran expert in itself is an absurdity. Right? You're an expert on an entire country in terms of its politics, its history, its social, <laughs> its gender, its uh, you know, everything. And, and yet people with a straight face will tell you, I am an Iran expert. And any question they ask of them, they will answer it with authority. Tell me about uh, gender rights. Tell me about oil prices. Tell me about the intricacies of Shia jurisprudence. And they will, with a straight face, <laughs> give you an answer. So yeah, I don't know if that answered your uh, question, but it was a great one. <laughs> I foretold my question. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, no, that's okay. I can talk to her around any <clears throat> Publicly, they will not. They will say no, and that they, uh, at least the Biden administration, will publicly say that they believe in the integrity, the sovereign integrity of the country. Uh, what they say privately, um, it's definitely a popular. Uh, within certain, <laughs> it's so hard to say these things. Within certain circles, it is a popular strategy to div the classic divide and conquer. Um, and there are a lot of people who see uh, specifically the Baluch and the Kurds as a very effective partners for the United States in that goal. Um, and I don't want to say that too loudly because I don't want to bring any uh, harm to those communities. Because I think that's a lot of this is in the Washington's imaginary. It's not about what's actually happening on the ground. So that's why I'm being cautious in what I'm saying. Uh, but there are people in Washington who have that fantasy for sure. Um, and I'm sure the, report, the person who wrote that report was Michael Rubin, who, by the way, uh, is a historian of Qajar history and does read and write Persian. And uh, like, so he hits a lot of the marks of what makes a, he. I think he won a Mesa Award a couple years ago for his work as a historian. Um, and he's at AEI. So. Sorry? Yes, of course. Yeah, and Fuad, and Fuad Ajemi was there, and Patrick Clausen. Patrick Clausen is at the uh, Washington Institute, and he uh, reads Persian very well. Yeah. So Marinoz, you wanted to get me in trouble, didn't you? <laughs> With that question, right? No, no, I don't. Well, no, no, I mean, You're yeah, I think I'm already in trouble, so let me just dive fully in, right? Well, honestly, there's something really insidious happening where uh, Washington uh, has self-selected who is allowed to speak as the voice of the Iranian people and very uncritically treat them as representatives of 87 million people. Um, and not just 87 million people, but also all the people in the diaspora. Um, cynically, the people I've talked to inside of USG, who, US government, who are kind of sophisticated, they're saying this is for optics. Uh, because even those same groups have attacked people like Rob Malley, who's supposed to be in charge of Iran policy, for being too pro-Islamic Republic. 
right? So there's this, they're playing a double game too, the US government, in terms of being like, yeah, sure, let's have um, former monarchs' <laughs> children come speak as the representative of the, uh, the movement. Yes, let's have Massey come and speak um, on behalf of, but privately, they're like, who should we be talking to? <laughs> they're like, who should we? They will, they will call people that they trust and know and be like, who should we actually be talking to? Whose plan do, so I met with someone recently who was at the National Endowment for Democracy who was like, we're struggling to find people who can tell us legitimately what's happening on the ground, right? Um, not what they aspire for, but what's really happening and what is the actual plan for moving forward. Right, so there's, there are good people who are like struggling to find those sources, um, but there's a lot of noise and fury, so to speak. So let me stop here and thank you again. <laughs> thank you.